Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna talk about joysticks and ones like this that hurt your hand. At least this hurts my hand a lot. I much prefer controllers like this, D-pad type controllers, things that you don't have to grip so hard like this. It just gives me cramps in my hands. So I wanna talk about various ways you can get these types of controllers working on computers like the Commodore 64, the Atari, and even the Amiga. Let's get right to it. We have a package here from John in Cumbria, UK. Hi to all my UK viewers. This package arrived June 9th, so this is quite a ways from when you're seeing this video. Sorry it takes me so long to get through everything. Let's see what's in this box. There's a note. Okay, well, it looks like a Super NES controller. Well, it's a Chinese clone variant. It doesn't say Nintendo on here anywhere. And then there's something plugged into the controller here. Let's pop this out. I'm not sure if that's focusing, but what that is, it looks like two DB9s that would go into the side of a Commodore. And then there's a Super NES controller port, of course, so you can plug a controller in and a small LED. Okay, let's check out what the letter says. Dear Adrian, find and close one of my Pad Switch 64 prototypes and a compatible controller to use with it. The unit I've sent you is different from the one released on my GitHub. The reason behind this is the GitHub version is designed to be easy to assemble, while the one I've sent you is something I would expect to be made if it had been released back in the day. That and I just can't stand the idea of large boxes hanging out the side of my C64 so that pushed me to miniaturize the design as much as I could. I only wish I had a 3D printer to finish it off. As I do not have access to a real NTSC Commodore, would it be possible for you to test the configuration software from the releases section of the GitHub on one of yours? With regards, John. Oh, cool. And there's a nice instruction sheet here on the back. And at a quick glance, it allows you to use the buttons on the joystick to, for instance, remap the buttons that the C64 sees and I think you can also ena enable turbo mode, and it looks like you could probably switch between the controller ports, so you can just do that on the fly instead of having to unplug and replug. So that's really cool. Let's take a closer look at this on the bench. So the Pad Switcher 64. Let's take a look. I'm pretty excited about this, to be honest. First, we'll unbox that again. So taking a close up look at this thing, there are the two DB9 female connectors and this would plug into the side of the C64. So it's got the perfect spacing for that. You see the little PCB that's behind it and there is a green power LED there or I think it's an actual status indicator LED. And then right here between these two connectors, there's a surface mount IC, which is undoubtedly an AT Mega microcontroller. Right here you'll see there's a 03 handwritten. Now John indicated that he hand assembled this special one for me and it's smaller than the normal one, probably because it has a surface mount IC as opposed to a normal full-size AT Mega. So I guess I have unit number three, the date of 2018, and there's that status LED again. So there's really not too much to this little thing. It's very small and very compact. On the back of John's letter, he printed out a nice instruction sheet for the Pad Switcher 64, and it includes here all of the various things that you can do with it. Let's give this a quick run through. So we have the directional pad as a fixed control. So the D-pad is always operating as the D-pad that ever changes. Then you use start and select and L and R, those are the top shoulder buttons, to enter direct mode or reset to default mode. I did a little reading and what direct mode is, is it allows the Commodore 64 to see all of the buttons on the controller. And that would be for specially written software that can take advantage of all of the available buttons on this. Now, I did see there's a couple games that were released that do use all of the buttons here, so we'll try those out in a little bit. And then we have Select and Up, which switches the D-pad Up button off. Now, that's pretty handy because on the C64, a lot of games use the Up button for jump because there's really only one button available on each controller port. But with Pad Switcher 64, it's able to remap one of the regular buttons to be Up. So if you have it mapped that way and you want to push a button to jump, 
you don't want to accidentally push left and right and accidentally hit the up here to jump. So that is pretty cool that you can actually disable that. There seems to be a default mapping in the controller. So Y is regular fire, X is a turbo fire, and then B is mapped to up. And then the A button is a special control port fire plus down or fire plus up. Obviously you can control that. I'm not sure why you'd use fire plus down, but there are probably some games where you have that combination to do some specific function. And then the right shoulder button is a matrix control port one fire. So I did a little reading on what that is. And while this D-pad is configured to use the second controller port, port two on the 64, pushing the right trigger button will push the fire button on the controller one port. And I guess there's some certain amount of games that use the space bar as an extra function, like while you're playing with a joystick, and that controller button maps to the space bar. So it would be a way to access that second button from the single controller. And then next is the start button. And I gotta say, this right here is the best possible feature. It swaps the D-pad controller to be between port one and port two, and that little LED that's on the little board lights up green to tell you that it's mapped one way and shuts off the other way. How many times have you booted up an older game, it uses the other control port, and you gotta sit there and unplug the joystick and move it over? Here, you just hit the start button. That is epic. And then the rest of the buttons here allow you to switch between your user-defined mapping, and there is some C64 software that allows you to set up this mapping. It doesn't look like you actually do this from the joystick. Uh, select start is the default mapping. Select left is the special toggle special mode. That's up here. That's this um, fire plus down or fire plus up. So I guess that depends on what game you're using. And then that matrix mode allows you to switch between uh, fire up, down, left, right for that other controller port. And then select plus down toggles two different turbo speeds for the fire button, which is very useful because some games you need to have a slower turbo speed than others. It just won't accept button pushes that quickly. So a oh, nice handy feature there. And then just checking out the controller that John sent. This is definitely a China special. It just doesn't feel that good. It's kind of spongy and, and not great, but it, it is a Super Nintendo controller. And believe it or not, I actually don't have a Super Nintendo. I have an original NES console, but I don't have an SNES. I don't have any controllers for it. So I'm really glad he sent this along because without this uh, China controller, I wouldn't be able to test this out at all. So this video would be kind of lame. Now, if you watch my channel regularly, you probably see me use this modified Nintendo controller on the Commodore 64. I simply wired this cable directly into the buttons in the D-pad on this controller. So there's really nothing to it. Later in this video, after I show off the Pad Switcher 64, I will open up this controller and show you what's inside and how exactly I wired this up. It's really simple, there's hardly anything to it. So uh, watch for that at the end of the video. What's extremely cool about the Pad Switcher 64 project is it's open source hardware. So everything is on GitHub here to make your own. I'll put a link in the description to this GitHub page so you can check it out yourself. But here is the non-surface mount version of this designed to be easily assembled. And like I mentioned, it's got a regular dip style microcontroller here for easy hand soldering. A couple of the passives are larger as well, but otherwise this thing is still really small and shouldn't stick out of your 64 too far at all. Ah uh, yes, here it says it's using the AT Mega 88 microcontroller. So easy to get and very inexpensive. He also has a pre-compiled hex file, so you don't have to worry about compiling your own code for the microcontroller. You just need to flash it. And there are many ways of flashing these microcontrollers. You can even use an Arduino to do it. I won't go into it, but it's simple to flash a hex file, especially if you have a TL866 Mini Pro, which you've seen on my channel a million times. That can flash the hex file directly onto these as well. Here's where he mentions that it, there's also that 64 software for setting those custom mappings. I thought originally you might be able to do it through the controller, but that doesn't seem the case. Documentation here is really good, explaining how everything works. Here's the fixed controls again. This table here shows you how joystick port one also shares lines on the CIA chip with the keyboard. So you may have noticed if you plug a joystick into port one, you push the controls on the joystick, you end up getting key pushes. This sharing is actually what makes using an unmodified Sega Genesis controller on the 64 dangerous. Because if you, I think, push a key at the same time as a controller button, it creates a short circuit and it can actually damage things. That may not be the exact reason, but definitely you shouldn't use an unmodified Genesis controller on a 64. It can cause damage under specific circumstances. And this section talks about the direct mode that you can turn on. This is where it maps all of the inputs on the SNES controller to one something on the 64. 
And if you take all the inputs that are available on the C64, you're actually able to map every single button on the SNES controller to something. He has the source code here for the microcontroller. And here under dip PCB, there's the schematics and the board layout and the bomb. It's, and clicking on releases over here on the right, that should take us to here. Yep, there we go. We got the hex file. That's the code that goes on the microcontroller. And then we have the Commodore 64 PRG file. This is the program you would use for the custom mappings. Well, let's give this thing a try. So I'm just going to connect to the controller first since the connector is a little stiff. It's probably not as easy to push in as a real SNES controller. It might be the controller or it might be the connector. Who knows? These are probably both from China. Anyways, we'll connect that up first. We've got the good old Ziff 64 here, and we will just stick this on the side. So this just plugs in like so, and it does stick up from the side of the case. Now, interesting is the clearance is pretty tight there. The SNES controller is directly up against the side of the case. Some 64 bread bins I have, the motherboard is actually more recessed inside the case. I think the very earliest uh, bread bins are like that. So this may not actually work on those. Oh, actually, I just happen to have one of these older C64s handy. This is one of the early, early version, the gold label, actually. So let's see if this actually fits on there. The motherboard is slightly recessed in the case, and let's just see how this goes. Oh, yeah, that works fine, too. So no problems plugging into this uh, earlier version. The connectors actually seem to stick out a little further than this, this metal plate. It's easy to tell these really early C64s because the printing is a bright white color. It's dimmer on the later ones, and then... The power connector has a square cutout around it as well. The later ones, the printing is dimmer, and then look how it has a round cutout for the power connector. So I do like how this is kind of flush to the computer, doesn't stick out, so if you have tight clearance, you know, you still have the joystick plugged in. In fact, it sticks out less than the power connector here. But what I don't love is if you tug on this cable that way, you know, it could break the connectors, it could cause some kind of damage. Although, pulling it forward, which is where it might more likely get pulled, is a little stronger. But ideally, I, I don't know, I'd almost rather it go straight out. Would that be safer? Maybe? I don't know. But anyways, it's very compact in this configuration, at least. All right, let's go check out that configuration software. John mentioned it may not work on a C64 here in the US, an NTSC version. So this is the software here, padswitcher.prg. I have it on my SDIEC. And let's run this. All right, padswitcher64, interface test and programming application. All right, so press select and start on control pad. So I'm just gonna push that and communication timeout with interface. So I ended up trying this several times and it definitely is not compatible. It doesn't work. There must be some timing thing that it's using to talk to the microcontroller and it's just not working, unfortunately. What is available here is you can push fire on port two, which is I think the Y button here. And this just goes into a kind of a joystick test mode where you can at least uh, check things out. So. Right now, the default mapping, Y is the fire button. X should be turbo, so that's blinking. We have B is for, for up, and then A should be fire and down. And there it is, fire and down. Uh, these top buttons, okay, this one here is that matrix mode, so that pushes fire on the other control port. Uh, that one does nothing, select does nothing. So if I push start, it will actually map to this controller now. So see, and it's that easy to switch between these, just push start. I mean, that, that right there is just epic. So back in this directory, there are two games here that I think have been customized to work with the direct mode on this controller. And as a side note, to go into direct mode, it is select, start, and left and right. So select, start, left and right, all the same time, should be in direct mode now. So let's load drop zone off the SDIEC. Oh, there it is. So <laughs> SNES64. And here's drop zone. I don't have the sound hooked up right now. It's just composite video. Ah, uh, look at that. Unfortunately, I don't think this is working on NTSC 64s. It's a, it's a European game, I think. So I'm gonna have to bust out the PAL 64. Let me do that right now. All right, now we're on the PAL 64. It's weird on this VIC too. There's color fringing around the letters. I don't, I don't really get what, what's happening there. First, let's check out the pad switcher application, the one that I couldn't get working on NTSC. And let's just see if this worked properly on here. Oh, look at that, it totally does work. So B is for test pads, and then Y set mapping. So I guess we'll try B. Okay, so up, down, left, right. Okay, I get it. So look at that, all of the buttons. That is pretty cool. That's an example of the direct mode right there. Start and select to exit, there we go. And then Y for setting the mapping. 
Mapping needs to be uploaded to the interface memory before they can be written to EEPROM. All edited mappings are written to EEPROM in one operations, blah, blah, blah. Select mapping to load, A, B, X, or Y. I guess A, I don't know. So looking at this matrix here, you have the keyboard matrix, right? So we have functions here, we have control port two, turbo functions, and then we have the buttons. I'm not totally understanding what's going on here. So it shows like pushing A is up down on control port one and down right on control port two. Like what, what kind of a mapping is this? Let's exit out of this and try to go back to a different mapping, set mapping. Let's try mapping B. Okay, that one has nothing in it at all. So let's exit out of that. Yeah, set mapping, A, B, X. Look at the X mapping, blank. Set mapping, and there's one more mapping available. And this one is also empty. So with this A mapping, I just don't really understand what, what this is. Is this more like the direct mode mapping? I, I'm gonna try one of the other mappings that seems blank. So I'll do the B mapping. I needed to push Y for upload. Uploading, please wait. Okay, exit. Uh, let's write EEPROM, start and select. All right, let's go back in here and just run the regular test. So I'm gonna push the fire button. Okay, so now it's currently using that mapping. I'm gonna switch to select B, which is my custom mapping. So that's the fire button. That's up, which is kind of how I like it, I think. I should do one each way. And okay, turbo is not working. These two buttons are supposed to be mapped to turbo and they don't. Also, the other thing is when you're in the custom map, if I switch between joystick one and two, so now it's controlling joystick port one for the D-pad, but the buttons are still on the wrong controller. So you almost need a separate map to, to have one for each controller because the buttons don't swap around when you're on the custom map. All right, let's try this again. Okay, set mappings, Y. We're gonna look at map B. I mean, it says turbo right there. Oh, I get it. So I'm supposed to set turbo and what function I wanna do. So I wanna do fire on both of these. Otherwise that turbo affects whatever you have. So I guess you could have turbo up or turbo down or any of these other things. That's pretty darn cool. Okay, so I'm gonna upload this. I'm gonna make a second map for these button configurations on this other controller port. So set mappings. I'm gonna do map, uh, I don't know, X, I guess. Uh, where I think I had, I forgot which way it was. This way, turbo, turbo. And this needs to be up. There we go. And I'm gonna say upload, press Y, uploading please wait. X for exit, and then I'm gonna say write EEPROM, start and select. It's just, it writes so quickly, that's, it'd be nice if it just showed that for a little second, like success or whatever. Okay, so right now we are in the default mode entirely. So there's turbo, so I'm gonna do select B. So there's the one turbo, and then I guess that's a, that's a slightly different speed, these two buttons. That's up, that's fire, that's how I like it. And the D-pad is working, and if I switch to the other one, so now it's on there, the map is wrong, but all I need to do is select the X map, and now the buttons are on the right one too. So that's that's cool, it works. All right, so now that this joystick is working, let's, let's go to one of these games. Let's try Kung Fu Master. I'm on the PAL machine, so hopefully this works. There's a sound, oh, there is sound. Turn that down a little bit. Kung Fu Master. Excellent, so let's see if I push a button. No, space. Oh, I gotta go to direct mode, I think. So push these together. There we go, okay. Number of players, one player. So this is working, difficulty one to five. Deep add to change options, start to play. So there's this is the toggle sound is the left trigger. Punch this, okay, start to play. Ah, okay, this doesn't work. <laughs> it froze as well. Now, I wonder if this is because it's not compatible to SDIC. Maybe I need to run this off my uh, um, disk drive emulator. Okay, that's kind of annoying. Why don't we try drop zone? See if this works. Okay, well, drop zone definitely works. That's a cool effect there. This is where this is crashed on the other, uh, on the NTSC machine. So let's see if this is working. Oh, awesome. This is like the, oops, I just died. It's very much like Defender, isn't this? Okay, so definitely all the buttons are working. <laughs> I died, your rank is not listed. Practice recommended, how insulting. All right, let's try a game here. Uh, Digilo, whatever, I don't know actually how to say this game here. Uh, 
Digiloy? Digiloy. Okay, so I need to exit out of direct mode, right? So I'm gonna push all this. Okay, and yeah, this is working. So that's fire, that's jump. And to turn off pushing up to jump, because you know I don't need that because I have a button to jump, that one, I push select and up at the same time. So now I can move left and right, but up doesn't do anything. But I can still jump. So let's see here. So yeah, it's like I'm using this uh, B button here to jump, which feels natural, right? This game's pretty impressive, by the way, how it's all text mode. I mean, how cool is that? Uh, you don't need to use turbo because this thing just hold the fire button down and actually shoots continually anyways. Okay, so this is where like pushing up to enter that door feels natural because that's sort of a typical thing. So over here, you would, you know, jump. But if I go to the door and I push the jump button, it, it switches levels, right? So, whoops. Okay, I'm. Uh, this is ridiculous. I keep dying here. Here we go. I'm doing a so die so quick here. So yeah, keep pushing up to try to go through that door. So I'm going to turn that back on again, select and up. So now the up button does jump, but I, you know, this controller is good enough. I'm not accidentally jumping and now I can go through doors in a more natural manner. So I got to say, I played a bunch of games with this thing and it works amazingly well. I just don't love the feel of this controller, but I just love the, the map ability of it. I love the turbo function and I love being able to swap between controller ports. I ran a couple old games like the original Defender for the C64 and it requires controller port one. So you just hit that start button and boom, you're up and running. No fiddling around with the connector on the side of the machine. This thing is freaking cool. So thanks very much, John, for sending this over to me. If you're a C64 gamer and you like D-pads, I highly recommend getting one of these for yourself or having one made, that is. Since it's open source, you can have all the parts made and you just order the rest from China and you should be able to easily assemble these. If you know a place that sells these already assembled, if you could please put a link in the comment section and I will pin that comment and add it to the description so people can more easily find that. Okay, next up, let's take a look inside my modified NES controller. So if you wanna make one of these yourself, you can. It's pretty simple as well. It's probably easier than making one of these if you already have one of these controllers sitting around and a cable. So let's take a look. So to make one of these controllers for yourself, you're gonna need two things. You'll need a Nintendo controller, one that you're okay with taking apart and making not work on the Nintendo anymore. And you'll need something that has the cable that will plug into the Commodore 64. You could make one yourself by taking some wire and adding a DB9 connector onto it. But honestly, if you go to the thrift store, you can find these Atari flashback controllers that are modern. So this is not like off of vintage 2600. And you can take the cable off of this and throw the rest of the controller away because in my opinion, these are pretty junky. Now these do work on the 64, so you can just use these as is, but why would you want to? This thing is horrible, in my opinion at least. So first off, we're gonna salvage the cable from this controller. There's the cable that comes in here, the wires. I recommend you just cut through these and that will just pops right out. This is with the little grommet thing. I didn't end up reusing the little strain relief here. So you could actually just cut the cable right here if you want, but uh, it doesn't really matter. It's completely up to you. Okay, next we have a Nintendo controller. This is an original one from the 80s. So it has the original cable still on it. This is not a reproduction. The new reproduction ones will probably work for a mod like this, but my video won't really apply to those because this uses a little dip dual inline package IC in here that's very easy to solder onto. Those new reproduction ones use blob chips and are very difficult to modify. Well, not very difficult, but they're more difficult than these. There are videos on the internet of modifying those other ones. So I'll look for some and link in the description below. So check those out if you have a reproduction you wanna modify. Now this modification to this original controller is completely reversible. It doesn't damage this controller in any way. And one reason for that is I'm not gonna be reusing this cable. Okay, so for the mod process, all you have to do is use a Phillips and take the six screws out on the back. The screws are out, so you just lift the back off like that. And there we go, that's inside the controller. This controller has built-in strain relief for the cable. So you see how it kind of goes around these pegs? That is why on the Atari cable, we're not gonna use that strain relief that's on there. You do need to cut the cable and actually expose the wires again because we need to run that new cable through these pegs to create that additional strain relief. Next, all the original controllers that I've looked in have this dip IC here. And what this is, is it's a shift register 
and it takes the button inputs and it shifts them serially through these wires into the Nintendo console. Taking a look at the wires here, there are only five that are used. Two of them are for voltage, which is ground and five volts, and then there are three additional wires, and that's all you need to represent all of these button pushes on this Nintendo because it's using the shift register. Even the Super Nintendo used a similar number of wires, as far as I'm aware, and you can shift in as many buttons as you need to serially over just these same number of wires. Well, since I already have a modified one of these, I'm not gonna modify this controller, but ultimately I can still show you exactly what I did so you can modify one of yours. What you need to do is remove the original cable. So all I did is actually just cut the wires right here and then you just pop the cable out of the strain relief like that and it comes right out. No fuss, no muss. Okay, we've jumped ahead and now we're looking at my modified controller. So the reason why I say this is reversible is because the Atari cable right here is soldered directly to the dip legs. And the original solder points from the Nintendo cable are still right over here. And I could just clean these out and re-solder that original cable back on to revert this thing back to original. I didn't make any other modifications to it other than removing the cable and then attaching the Nintendo wire directly to this IC. So let's pop this thing out of the little strain reliefs and lift this PCB out. All you have to do is just lift straight up on it and it does come out. There are little pegs and it holds on just like that. Now, these little rubber things and the buttons are flopping around. So make sure you don't tip this upside down or all your buttons and the rubber contacts are gonna go flying. So here's the PCB, at least on my controller. They'll vary slightly, but they'll all basically be almost the same as this. What you see here are little contact pads. So this is for the D-pad, the start and select, and the A and B button. And what happens is when you push on one of these buttons, there's a little rubber pad here with carbon impregnated into it, makes it conductive. And it pushes that against the little contact pads that are on the PCB here, and that essentially completes the circuit. Pretty much all D-pad type controllers and also remote controls for your TV and things like that all use the same exact technology. There is some design considerations that goes into making them more reliable or not. And obviously Nintendo did a great job because these controllers still work perfectly after what, 35 years. The Nintendo controller uses this sort of black colored uh, pad. It's sort of painted or coated with something that seems to make it more resistant to corrosion than some of the cheaper contacts that you might find in say a keyboard or certain cheap remote controls. Anyway, if you sit down, you just look at the way these buttons are hooked up to this IC, it all sort of makes sense. If you look on the left side of the A and B button here, you'll notice that that trace is actually connected to each other. And if you follow it around, you'll notice it's actually also connected to this button and that's connected right there. So all of these buttons actually have the same signal on one side and the same will go for the D-pad. And what happens is when you actually make contact with the button, then it conducts that five volts back through to through this other trace and it will end up back in this IC chip. So each one of the pins on the shift register is connected to the right side of every single one of these buttons. Controllers that have more buttons might be a little bit more complicated, but the original NES is, is just that simple. You can ignore this little wire that I've added to the IC here. I'll talk about that in a minute, but for now, let's just imagine it's not there. All right, so the way I figured out how to wire this up is I just wrote down all of these pin numbers here. So this IC looks like it has 16 pins, so let's just draw 16 little pins on this piece of paper and we'll just number them one through eight and then nine through 16. And now what's left to do is you need to trace the signal that goes to each one of the buttons to the right pin on the chip. So let's look at the down button on the D-pad. On the left is that shared pin that goes to all these other pads. So we know that that's not the one we need to worry about. We need to worry about this side. So all we do is we just trace this pin and that goes right here. So then on the paper, you just draw right there and you put a little line and you put down. You need to do this process for your controller because it's quite possible that the pinout is different on yours. The chip might be flipped around, who knows what's going on. So go through this exercise of mapping out every single button that you're gonna then route to the Commodore 64. I didn't bother with the start and the select button. So I didn't even bother tracing those. I only traced the up, down, left, right, and A and B. Next, what you need to do is a quick Google for C64 joystick pinout. So you can figure out which pins on this Atari cable go to what function. Now port one and port two has the same. Pin one, for instance, is the up button, two down, left, right, and so on. Notice there is only one fire button, and then there is a plus five volts, and there's a ground signal. The problem with most of these pinouts you'll find on the internet, like this one included, 
is what you don't know here is are you looking at the pins on the Commodore 64 or are you looking at the pins on the joystick port? So this is a female connector and the 64 has male, so it has the pins. You don't know what we're looking at here. It should say, you know, on 64 or on connector. That would give us the clue as to what we're looking at. But right now there's no way to tell. Sometimes the connector actually has pin numbers written in tiny little writing next to these holes. Unfortunately, this cheap Atari flashback one, it doesn't. So there's really no way to know what we're looking at here. Really, the only way to figure out for sure what we're looking at is to plug this cable into the Commodore 64, strip off some of these wires here, and look for the five volt and ground signals that are coming through this. Once we've figured out which are five volts and which are ground, you can then unplug this from the 64 and then you can take, say, the ground signal and look for which pin on this connector is the ground. And that will give us, without a doubt, the orientation of the connector. Now, I already went through this entire process of testing this and figuring it all out. I can't show it in the video because I've already done it, so you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself. And don't go off the colors you see here because the cable you have is probably gonna have different colors and the layout of this controller is gonna be different. So you're gonna have to do all this figuring out for yourself but it really isn't that difficult if you just work logically and you write it down. So what you do is you're gonna go through the up, down, left, right, and then the fire button, find the wires on your connector, and then you're gonna solder those onto the appropriate pins on the chip here based on which ones you wanna use. So if you wanna use uh, the, the rightmost button as your fire button on 64, trace that pin back, and then you solder the pin six here, the wire that's for pin six, onto that pin on the IC. Now, don't forget, if you're on like this pin here over here on the left, when you turn the board over, it's gonna be on the right, right? So you gotta be able to flip that around. So now you have all the directions and the fire button connected. What we don't have is the final signal that you need to allow the 64 to detect you pushing the buttons. Now on the 64, the way it works is you ground the pin. So you say ground the up pin, pin one, and then the computer thinks you're pushing up. So on my particular cable, the ground pin, which is pin number eight, goes to the black wire, which is right here. I have it soldered to that far pin. And if we flip this over, you'll notice that this pin I have it soldered onto is the common pin that goes to every single button on the PCB. So I don't know if that was originally ground or five volts or what it was. So that pin goes to all of these connectors and that's the commonality. So it's ground from the 64. And then what happens when you push the appropriate button, like the up button, it then shorts this ground signal through to this orange wire, and that tells the 64 that you wanna move up. So that brings me to this little jumper wire that I added here. Remember how I said on my controller, I can push up to move up in the game, but I can also push this button right here, the A button. I have it written as jump, but of course that's the same thing as just pushing up. And that's because since there's only one fire button, most 64 games require you to push up to do the jumping. And I find that really annoying if you're trying to push left or right and you gotta hold diagonally. So just wiring up one of these two buttons to be the up button, it works amazingly. So all I did is if you remember, this button here is the one I have as the fire button. So that's going off to the appropriate fire wire. But this one here wasn't hooked up to anything. So all I did was I followed the trace that goes around over to the chip for this button on the right, and it happens to be that pin, and I just took a little piece of wire and I soldered it from there to there, which was the up button, and now pushing up or pushing the button or pushing both at the same time is the same thing as pushing up. It's really as simple as that. If you're gonna swap these buttons around or say you wanna use start to select for up as well or some other function, do the same thing. Just wire up the start button to whatever function you want it to be, and it'll work. There's really not a lot of complexity going on with this board. It's just very simple connecting the ground through to the appropriate pin. So no matter what kind of controller you have, you can always figure out how to make this happen because even if this IC were under a blob, these traces would still be there. And all I need to do is scrape off some of the solder mask and solder the wire directly onto the trace. And it would be able to do the same thing. It'd be a little less pretty because uh, the wires would have to be on this side of the board and there is not a lot of room because of all of these um, plastic bits and the little rubber things on for the buttons. But on the original Nintendo controller, because they're just using a single IC, solder it on there, easy as pie. What I recommend is that there might be a couple extra wires coming through here. Like there's gonna be potentially that five volt wire. 
you just need to cut that off and make sure that it doesn't touch anything in the controller. So I can't remember if that was the case. I don't see any cut wires. So I actually don't think there was the plus five cable. It's just not even inside of this. But if there is one, make sure you cut that off because it's totally unused in this particular circumstance. All right, so now I think this is all together. So what I'm gonna do is stick the PCB back in here. And before we put it together, you need to do some testing because even me, when I was doing this, it took me a few times before I, before I got this right. I kind of screwed it up and I don't, I don't know, I had like up and down reversed or left and right reversed. It's easy because there's a lot of, you know, swapping the board upside down and flipping it around. So you just sort of put this back in like that. Most of what's holding the board in is actually the cover we've removed. So, you know, you can't really push on the buttons right now. It'll just push this out, but it's okay if you sort of hold it with your thumbs and then push these buttons. All right, I've hooked up a 64 to the monitor. Ignore that it's black and white. That's just because the way I have it hooked up. I have my easy flash cartridge in and I'm gonna go to Adrian's tools, which is, I have a program called Joystick Check. It shows a little graphical representation of up, down, left, right, and the buttons to help you know if you've done it right. All right, so while I'm holding this down, if I push up, you see it's a little hard to see because of the lack of color, but there's up, down, left, right. So that's working correctly. And the button, so this button over here, remember, is the up button, and the other one is the fire button, which is the center one. Yeah, use a program like this to check your up, down, left, right, and all that stuff. And if it's wrong, you know, check your wiring, check your little pinouts, and then fix the pins on here. If you're not getting anything at all, well, I think you've done something very wrong with the wiring, and you know, check that out first, make sure that you have everything connected properly. And now it's just a matter of putting this thing back together and getting it all screwed in. And my trick, which I learned from Fran Blanche, is you put the screw in and you turn it backwards until you feel a click, and then you thread it in. And that's because we're screwing into plastic and when you don't have them screw in the exact right position, you might be making new threads into the plastic. And this is so old and brittle, this controller, that that could easily break things. So all you do is you go backwards, and then I felt a click, and then you go forwards. And you really don't need to screw this in super tight. So I'm just doing it pretty loose. You don't want it so loose that it, you know, it's not gonna hold together, but ultimately you don't wanna make it so you're gonna be breaking these little standoffs either. Okay, let's test this out. I have it plugged into the 64 and I have the game Hero working. This game is very helpful to have up programmed as one of the buttons because you constantly need to push up to fly in this button. So if you can do it by pushing a button, that means that you can more easily push left and right and fly at the same time without making a mistake. So let's, here's an example. If I blow that wall up, and I want to run straight across over to here, I'm going to need to fly across there. So all I need to do is push that button as I get near the edge, and I don't need to worry about having to push diagonally. See, when I push diagonally, okay, that time I did it okay. But see, that time I got caught because I actually fell a little bit. But now, it's really easy. This game, is it almost feels like cheating because it's so much easier. And then shooting is, is the typical shooting. Yep, it's all like that. Well, that's gonna be it for this video. Huge thank you to John for sending me the Pad Switcher 64. I've used it quite a bit more since shooting this video, and I gotta say, I really like it. I have been working with him through his GitHub page on trying to make the software that lets you configure the pad work on NTSC machines. So far, no luck, but it still works great out of the box, and it's a great option even for those in the US. Check the GitHub page if you wanna make it yourself, all the code's available, all the schematics. It's pretty easy to make. So if you liked this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button, subscribe for more videos and uh, push that little bell icon if you want to be notified when I post more and put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.